with that being said, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, Debbie F. from New York. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I really appreciate the invitation from you and um, the invitation from my higher power. This is where he wants me to be tonight, and I'm very happy. And um, I want to compliment the group on the wonderful way that you handled uh, the beginning of this meeting. Um, your pros, I can see. Anyway, I'm a very grateful alcoholic, and um, I'm always um, very honored to speak in the rooms of the AA and, um, you know, tell you a little bit about uh, what it was like for me personally, you know, what happened and what I am like today. And I can tell you right off the get-go that I am unrecognizable from the woman who walked into the rooms of AA. Uh, but for the grace of God and the work that he has allowed me to do. And I'm one of those people that feels that I was born as an alcoholic. And I also want to say, I see a few of my friends from New York on here, and I want to say thank you for your support. How nice. Um, anyway, um, learning what I have about alcoholism, I, I really do feel that I was born with this disease. I had a disease of the attitudes right from the beginning. There was something very much different about me from other little kids. You know, and it just seems that there was something right from the beginning that I struggled with my emotions. You know, I was not someone who um, could handle life on life's terms right from the beginning. I was a very sensitive kid and I took, you know, emotions to the extreme. My emotions were, you know, uh, way up there and way down there. And, um, you know, but I was a chameleon right from the beginning too, because I can tell you that you know, I've gained a lot of knowledge about myself, you know, through, you know, through step work and so forth. And I have learned, I'm an introvert today. You would not have known that when I first got sober, I was this wild, wild woman. And uh, I was the one that was always so self-conscious, but yet I was the one uh, performing for everybody. So there was always this conflict with, you know, who I was and uh, what was going on on the inside as opposed to what you saw on the outside. And so I took on the struggles of life at an early age. My family, you know, I, I had a big family. I had 23 aunts and uncles starting out. And I could tell you that I've been in love with drunks my whole life because my favorite aunts and uncles were the drinkers, you know, and uh, my father was that bartender and I just wanted to be part of that bar. And I was the kid, the Brooklyn kid who was in bars at a very early age. And, um, you know, I see looking back that, you know, I developed the characteristics of the alcoholic in the sense that from an early age, I started blocking out my feelings. You know, I started stuffing and I, you know, would try to turn off all the negatives that I saw the drinking causing in my family with mommy and daddy fighting and who's leaving who and all of that stuff. And I would, you know, uh, look at all the happy things that I saw in the bar, you know, like I wanted to have that action and I tried to block out, you know, the painful stuff, but I just, you know, was pushing it down and pushing it down and, um, you know, doing a lot of damage, you know, uh, to myself in the process. And I know that sounds ridiculous as a young child, but I really tried to escape right from the giddy up. You know, I was like the kid who lived in a fantasy world, you know, I just built up all kinds of fantasies just to make, uh, uh, make life bearable for whatever reason. And, um, you know, I was, you know, a kid that was exposed to the drinking world very young. I started drinking at a very early age and it's, you know, remarkable to me today, uh, but it was available. There was something in me that, you know, was looking for escape and, uh, and I went for it. And so, um, you know, my journey, my, my disease of progression, you know, I was the one that, you know, I can't look back and tell you that at, you know, uh, as an, at an early age, I felt the ease and comfort of what the first drink did for me. I just know that, you know, I just wanted to be accepted and part of back in those early, you know, years. So I did, you know, I went along with the crowd, but it affected me differently, right, you know, right from the beginning. Uh, it affected me in the sense that um, I was always, uh, again, looking for escape, wanting to get out of myself because it was too painful. 
And, um, you know, really to speed it all up, I uh, wound up leaving Brooklyn, which was my, uh, where I was brought up uh, at 12 years old. And we went to a community where, of course, there was drinking, uh, and it was totally different from what I was accustomed to. And as you hear, you know, I took myself with me and the disease of the attitudes were very prevalent at 12 years old. Um, uh, again, I had a mouth on me. My father used to be the one that would tell me all the time that mouth of yours is going to get you in a lot of trouble. And, you know, uh, anyway, I lost my father within a year. Uh, I was 13 and he passed away. And that would be like, you know, if looking back, it was a turning point. Because they tell us that, you know, if there was any control of my drinking, it was before he passed. Because I didn't want, you know, he was like, you know, my, the love of my life, so to speak. And I uh, didn't want to hurt him. So I did try to, um, you know, not uh, cause problems to him. But soon as he passed away, uh, at 13, I was arrested for the first time two weeks later. It was like the rebel you know, it was like I became this person who uh, really rebelled against everybody and everything, and I became a victim. You know, I became a victim, and I became a victim of my own expectations. You know, looking back, I became a victim of expectations. I thought the world owed me an awful lot because of this bad break I get and uh, this painful life, and I was, you know, uh, had this sense of entitlement and expectations that, you know, nobody can fill. So the resentments start to build at that early age. And my resentments build into a it rage. I become a rageaholic. Um, I'm the type of person that it, when I put drink in me, I have no control and have no idea what I'm going to do. And I identify with every speaker in the AA rooms because I am capable, and I know that, of putting alcohol in this body, I am capable of doing anything that I have heard ever shared in the rooms of AA. Because I certainly was doing things that I didn't want to be doing, but I was a rebel without a cause, and I, you know, um, alcohol started to rob for me very early. I didn't have any goals. I was not a student. I had no education when I came into AA. I graduated from nothing because I was a truant and a, and a troublemaker. And uh, so alcohol took away any ambitions or any desire to make anything of myself because um, I had that self-defeating type of attitude that I was never going to amount to anything. And so I, I went that route. I was the kid that, you know, or the young woman that drank and everything that I should have been proud of, I was ashamed of. And everything I should have been ashamed of, I had this proudness about. So I was getting very confused about, you know, life and how to live at a very early age. And the alcohol just fueled it all and, um, you know, put me into that state of uh, the four horsemen. You know, I was constantly in a state of frustration, terror, bewilderment, and despair. It was really what I knew. It was what I knew. And uh, as you hear in the rooms, you know, uh, there's no escape. It was that constant, you know, vicious cycle of, you know, trying to escape from yesterday, you know, by forgetting today and then dealing with that morning scene on the bed. I always identify with that, the drunk on the bed, because that was me, you know, sitting on that bed in the mornings like, wow, how did I get into this one? And what am I going to do now? And, um, you know, one of the one of my arrests, I was arrested when I was 16 years old on an assault charge. And again, because I had that rage and um, I reacted to life. You know, we hear about how, um, you know, uh, I was the impulsive drunk. I was the impulsive person who didn't think before I acted. You know, I always just was impulsively into things. And, um, you know, so I would do these things. I would get caught up in these jams and, you know, uh, on this particular arrest, it was the first time that I, the self-centeredness of the alcoholic left me enough to really think while I was waiting, I had to spend the night because I had to go before the judge the next day. And I witnessed my mother being held up by two policemen because it was the first time she couldn't get bail. And um, 
I sat there thinking, and, and I've seen this in the big book, you know, with, with Bill so many times when he stood at that turning point. And this would be like the first turning point in my life where I would sit there and I would think about my poor mother and I would, you know, really say to myself, you know, I don't want to do this. I, I didn't want to be this person. I didn't want to treat my, my mother, you know, and my family through this. Um, but I, I, I couldn't know then that I had no defense against the first drink. And even though I wanted to change, I wasn't capable of it as long as I still was using the alcohol. And so, you know, I, I remember thinking, you know, Debbie, you, you got to knock this chip off your shoulder. You know, I knew I had an attitude problem, you know, but everything else, you know, I was just trying to survive. So anyway, to make a long story short, you know, uh, the next day when I came out, you know, my mother and I were traveling home on the bus. She asked me to go to AA. And I could tell you that after spending all that time thinking about how I was going to change, when she asked me to go to AA, I jumped right down her throat, which was my usual MO, you know, because don't tell me what to do kind of thing, you know, and it was all because of fear. It was all, I wore all these masks, you know, you hear about the fight or flight kind of thing. And that was how I looked at, you know, that's how I dealt with life during those years when I had no tools. It was either run away from, you know, my problems, um, think about suicide or, you know, um, fight the world, you know, like just uh, fight or flight. That was it. Run away or fight everybody around me. Because I was in so much pain, you know, we know we hear that expression, hurt people, hurt people, you know, so when my mother asked me, I wanted no part of AA at that time. And really what happened was, um, you know, I became a promising alcoholic, you know, I'm always touched by the story about Bill W. when he used to write Lois little notes. And he used to promise her that I'm going to get sober this time, Lois, I'm going to do it. And I used to write my mother these pitiful suicide notes, you know, like pour my heart out and oh, how I don't want to be like this and what's wrong with me, put me away, you'll be better off, all this drama that went along with my drinking. And, um, but I did do that. I became this promising alcoholic that I was always going to straighten up and fly right and all of that. But again, I had no defense against the first drink. And I would have many times that I would think about going to AA because I, I was fortunate. I had knowledge of AA uh, because of family members and uh, meeting people when I was a kid who were in the program. And um, how, how I was actually, the plant was seated in a man's house. Uh, he was uh, sober 17 years when I met him when I was 12 years old. I hung out in his family home. And he used to, you know, have people in from AA when he celebrated anniversaries. And the people would come in and um, it was always in the winter. And then my girlfriend and I would, you know, like uh, uh, serve coffee and listen to them. And we would say, how do these people stay sober? All they do is talk about being drunk, you know? So, but that is where the seed was planted. And the seed was planted for me. The program of attraction came with this one man who, um, you know, was drunk and he was too, in, too ashamed to come in. But, but this fellow that was celebrating, Mickey, was his sponsor. And he would show up. It was like he would just show up because he wanted to shake Mickey's hand. And I would watch the men of AA go outside in, in the winter and just go out there and shake his hand and talk, spend time with him. And that was the attraction. I was attracted to these men that, you know, cared that much about this, this guy that was drunk outside. And um, so the seed was planted. And uh, fortunately for me, I knew that AA was for alcoholics. But I, being a very self-destructive personality, you know, uh, didn't want it then. But I am one of the very fortunate that I did get it early. And um, so my life went on. I spent many lifetimes prior to coming into AA, even though I did all my drinking as a teenager. Um, I, you know, was always looking for people, places and things to make me happy. I was, you know, men were my thing. I only hung out with men. I was not a, a ladies, uh, you know, person. 
I was, uh, I drank with all the older men. Old men were my thing. <laughs> and so I would sit in the old time bars and hang out with these men. I was sitting in bars at 16 years old. Um, and uh, my mother had no control over me. My mother would come into the bars and drink on the bar stool next to me because she had no control. And, um, and so anyway, I, I led this life where I hung out with, you know, I tried to, uh, you know, uh, do the motorcycle thing. And then I tried to be a hippie in the 60s, but I was too angry. Uh, so that wasn't uh, the way to go for me. Um, then I tried other types of people, you know, the, the street fighters. And then I wound up with gangsters. So I was always looking for outside things to just carry me along. So uh, I felt worthwhile. I mean, and I didn't have that going for me, believe me. So drink was my friend. You know, you hear that, you know, drink was the solution because I couldn't cope with life. And, you know, um, I love the bedevilment on page 52 because I so identify with it. You know, I was prey to misery and depression all the time. You know, I felt totally useless in this world uh, and that everybody be better off without me. I was extremely, extremely emotionally immature. You know, I thought I was a sharp lady, you know, but I was emotionally crippled. I fell in love 10 times a day, you know, no controls at all. You know, I was getting married to five men at the same time. You know, I was like all over the place because I had no ability, you know, to think straight or any of that. And I just coveted, you know, just pour more drink in me to just get through the, you know, get through it all. And um, I had no good relationships. When you think about it, you know, I picked up drink before I was emotionally and physically involved with people. So I was a sick cookie going into things, you know? So I never had any kind of education on life, you know, uh, growing up and having relationships with people and so forth. You know, I just, you know, um, I primarily was a giver. I was a caretaker, um, so to speak. I was a people pleaser and all of that kind of stuff, but I was starving. You know, I was starving for you to care about me and all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's a long drawn out story in the sense, and you all get the idea that I just was a very confused girl and alcohol was my solution, but alcohol got me into an awful lot of trouble. And um, I was told by the time I was 15, I wouldn't live to be 20 because I had already deteriorated brain cells at 15 years old. And I would go on to have physical damage caused by alcohol at a very early age. I always kid with people now, when I was a, a drunk, I would go to the doctors and they would say, I can't believe you, you're 16, 17 and, you, and you, you got this wrong with you. Now I'm 66 and I go to the doctors, they say, I can't believe you're this old and you're this healthy. <laughs> so we do reverse. We can have a total turnaround in AA. Uh, but back then the doctors always found things wrong with me from the abuse of alcohol. And so it wouldn't have been the physical pain that brought me to my knees. You know, even the spiritual would not, you know, because I cursed God, you know, I was from, a, you know, brought up Catholic, but, you know, I had a lot of prejudices, you know, I, res I had resentments about the Catholic religion because I was forced to go out to church on Sundays when my mother and father stayed home and, you know, uh, just resentments all over the place growing up. So Spiritually, I was dying. I was dead because I lost a lot of friends and relatives to the disease of alcoholism. But it would be the mental anguish of this disease. You know, they talk about the fact that alcoholism is the loneliest disease in the world. And there's nothing like the loneliness of an alcoholic. You know, that uh, to me, that loneliness constantly made me want to uh, get out of here. You know, uh, the suicidal thinking was constant. Um, you know, never had the courage, I guess. There would be different types of, you know, uh, situations where I put myself in very dangerous things, hoping to be killed, um, you know, all kinds of craziness. But, but here I was. And so anyway, um, I was 12-stepped into the rooms of AA. I was, you know, one of those people. I had started working in Manhattan on a barroom bet. You know, people were saying to me, you know, you're never going to amount to anything. You never get a job. And I went into Manhattan and I got, I did get a job. And um, 
I started panhandling on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan to get money to go drink in the, in the, in the bar in the lobby. This was what, you know, I didn't need money in my own neighborhood because we all know why. You know, but in Manhattan, trying to be, you know, a, a, a civilian, so to speak, I had no money and I started panhandling. And the, and, the, and the business that I was working for, the glamorous building on Fifth Avenue, became aware of the fact that one of their employees was panhandling outside, you know, and uh, they called me in for the shape up or ship out kind of thing. And I was only on this job a few months. And this is how my higher power had played out throughout my drinking. He always put people in my path to try to help me. I'm like the one that he sent the helicopter, he sent everything to me and I kept throwing it back in his face. And these people were willing to move my employment date so that they could get me into a hospital. And uh, you know, I had all the characteristics of the alcoholic in the sense that my pride my pride was outrageous. You know, I, I, I was so concerned about what you thought of me. And, you know, I sat there that day and I told them, no, I don't need any help. I'll be here tomorrow. You know, those grandstands. Uh, and again, the alcoholic, I always read in the big book, I believed it. I believed that I w wanted to do it. I wanted to do the right thing. So why can't I do the right thing? I couldn't do it because I couldn't stay away from the drink. I didn't have that defense. So I made the grandstand at the job. No, I'll be here, blah, blah, blah. And needless to say, I had already picked up the drink. I identified with the first drink when I came into the rooms of AA because I knew I could never predict what was going to happen once I started drinking. If I had a family gathering or something that was so important, I would try not to drink because I knew that once I started. So I had already started drinking that day that they pulled me into that office with a couple of executives. And, um, you know, the next day I wake up, I'm on a drunk, I'm, you know, I'm someplace that's not familiar to me. The four horsemen return. I'm sitting on the edge of the bed. What am I going to do? Well, what am I going to call up this job? And, you know, um, so it, and that's the way it went. That's the way my life was going. And anyway, for me, I was very fortunate that shortly after this, I had hit, you know, a couple of bottoms. I had thought of coming to AA a few times. Um, you know, and um, again, just never getting that, that foot in the door. But I wound up in a big jam uh, in Long Beach. Um, I actually had, you know, I did one of my flight routines and I was out um, at an aunt's house on Long Island. And the funny thing is, is that um, a, a girlfriend of mine who was gotten into this uh, predicament with me, her father sent it to Veritas Villa which is a rehab center in New York. And uh, I couldn't get, I didn't know where she was. I'm hiding out on Long Island. I didn't know where she was hiding out. And the funny thing is, is that eventually she got a hold of me and uh, she said to me, Debbie, you're gonna love, I'm up in Veritas Villa hanging out with these drunks, these alcohol, you're gonna love them. These are your kind of people, <laughs> you know, and, um, but anyway, shortly after that, I would get into another jam and it would be this girl who uh, would call me up and uh, somebody had said, you know, Debbie needs help. And anyway, she, I went over to her house and, you know, the simple 12 step call that she did for me that night was that she was basically uh, trying to explain to me that there's a better way of living than the way I was living then. And that uh, these people in AA were wonderful and all this stuff, you know, she was enthusiastic and you know, she gave me something to cling to enough to say I would go to a meeting. And uh, so I did make my first AA meeting. And, um, you know, I came because I knew that AA was for alcoholics and that, you know, I was an alcoholic. I knew I had a drinking problem. And, uh, but I didn't even want to live at the time. But AA's powers, you know, uh, really, the message of AA is powerful. My higher power is so good to me. And I came in and uh, I had one early slip where, you know, I came back on the little slogan that once you're an alcoholic, it's not going to get any better. I put down my last drink February 17th, 1975. So I am sober 45 years now. And uh, it is quite, quite a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, but I got in my way an awful lot. And the journey was difficult. And I just want to share with you a little bit now about untreated alcoholism. 
because when I came into the rooms of AA, it was very different. I very often I would be the only woman and um, I became a two-stepper and it saved my life. Um, I got involved with, you know, all the guys in early recovery that were doing 12-step work all over the place. Um, you know, we spent, you know, all the time going to rehabs and putting people into treatment and all of this stuff. And I got a great education. Um, I saw, you know, wet brains back in 1975 in the, in the mental institutions and so forth and, and the drunk tanks. There were a lot of wet brains. And somebody said to me one day, you know, a wet brain is simply somebody who went into a blackout and never came out. And I said, wow, that is something, because I was a blackout drinker from the very beginning. And um, I never could, I couldn't differentiate real from fake uh, at all when I first got sober, uh, because I um, had other problems and I hallucinated a lot. So I really couldn't get things straight. So the first, th you know, the first thing that I had to do, the first message I got in AA was certainly that I had to put down the drink. I didn't have a shot in hell if I was going to continue drinking. So, you know, the first thing was to surrender. God gave me the gift of desperation. He gave me that gift of willingness to, to put the drink down. And then, as I said, AA gave me a purpose for living right away. It saved my life. I was by no means capable of doing um, the 12 step work that I can do today, but it was enough to give me a purpose to hold me up for a while because my journey was going to be very difficult. I didn't get into the work right away. I became a two stepper, which means I took the first step and I didn't drink. And I, you know, and I got involved with these men that were doing a lot of 12 step work. It kept me going. Uh, it kept me, you know, my adrenaline, you know, I was 20 years old at the time. So just hanging out with these guys, it was enough. But then, you know, things start to get difficult. And when you don't get into the work and find a solution, you live in the problems and the problems get wider and bigger and life becomes a, 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 even more difficult because now I don't have the booze, you know, to take the edge off and to, you know, do the magic that the booze could do for me. Now I'm dealing with life and I don't like Debbie. I didn't like Debbie when I came in here. And so now, you know, I'm not liking her anymore because my emotions are extreme. I'm still a reactor, you know, and I'm getting into a lot of trouble. All I did was move my bar stool into the, into the AA rooms. You know, I'm hanging out with, you know, all of these guys and uh, I'm self will run riot and I didn't get into the work. And anyway, what it looks like when you don't get into the work is a lot of pain, a lot of pain that you don't know what to do with. And um, uh, for me, I had anxiety attacks. You know, I was running to emergency rooms because, again, my emotions were extreme um, when I was coming up to my second anniversary, um, I was 22 years old. I was pregnant at the time in a bad relationship and I had a heart attack at 22 years old. And the doctors came into my hospital room and they said, you know, we've taken all kinds of tests and it appears that you're the kind of person that holds all your problems inside. And if you don't find a way to vent it, you know, your heart can't take it. And of course, I got very depressed after this because these doctors did not know that I was in AA coming up on two years, a program that was trying to tell me that I didn't have to go this alone, that I had to learn to trust, you know, that the people in AA were not going to judge me and ask me to leave and all these tremendous fears that I built up. And um, so that's what I was doing. I was just wearing a lot of masks in AA and still covering up the fears, you know, and all the uh, insecurities that I had. So after that hospitalization and getting into some outside therapy, I learned the importance of starting to get the garbage out. You know, there's a saying from Mother Teresa that nothing good can get in unless the garbage, the bad gets out. And that's what I had to start doing you know, through doing the step work, starting to look at myself. See, I was like, I, I was the person who didn't think I was going to measure up in AA. My, my low self-esteem told me I wasn't going to be able to do this. So I was resistant. 
And we learn in AA that the pain, you know, the resistance is what brings on the pain. So I had to get the solution in the second step. I had to learn to rely on a higher power rather than have this defiance and this self-sufficiently, you know, I'm, 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 look at me, woman, let me roar, all of that stuff. I can handle it. I'm a survivor and all of that. And I was killing myself. And God didn't want this for me because he kept putting, he kept sending the lifeboats. You know, he kept sending all the messages, you know, but I just was so afraid of not measuring up that I would push everything away. And I had to hit emotional bottoms and spiritual bottoms in AA before I realized this is untreated alcoholism, that I wasn't getting better and I was going to die if I didn't change my ways and get a different perspective of what I needed to do. And anyway, you know, from there on, it becomes all of the message of how important the step work is. You know, um, I can tell you another story after that one where, you know, I, um, I wound up getting married, you know, my first marriage in AA. Again, looking outside myself, expecting others to make me happy. The expectations were so unrealistic and they were so painful. So today I'm, I'm always, I'm always talking to my sponsees about expectations, you know, uh, and, and finding a different perspective and getting the balance in life and, uh, you know, that third step prayer. You know, now I get into the solution and I get the gift, you know, of building up a spiritual foundation in the rooms of AA. It would take, you know, it took a long time. I, uh, the, 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 I was sober six years when I would go on to lose my third pregnancy. And, uh, you know, I grew up with this, this great want of just being a mother. I had a great maternal thing. And, um, you know, I know that it was part of my low self-esteem. It was a thing of wanting to be loved kind of thing. And uh, so now I uh, wind up pregnant. I'm married. And I think I'm doing all the right things. You know, I'm sober six years um, and now I get pregnant, you know, um, and I lose that baby in the fifth month. And that would be devastating. And it would be something again, that was a gift, you know, uh, a gift in disguise because I lost my faith for the moment. I went back to a punishing God, you know, um, with this whole thing. And I didn't want to drink. But I fought getting on a bus and becoming a bag lady, you know, because that looks simpler to me than this sober way of living that's just not meeting my demands. <laughs> you know, it's like the thing in the third step where I'm not getting the healthy children. I'm not getting all the, uh, the bells and whistles. And so now I want to do the real runaway and become a bag lady, you know, because then I have no responsibilities and so forth, you know. So how crazy, but that's where the alcoholic mind will take me, you know, because the disease centers up, you know, up here, and it's the one that's going to, you know, get put me in danger of picking up the drink. But luckily for me, I had a good foundation in AA, and the people around me could see what was going on, and they started to get build my faith back. You know, I had friends that would call me up and say, read page such and such out of God calling or, you know, whatever spiritual readings I did, you know, and I built my faith back. And then I went on to have my beautiful AA baby, who's now 37 and a proud member himself of AA. <laughs> so we have no control over who gets this disease. But the good news for us here is that our loved ones know about us, you know, and that we're sober people. So um, I went on to have that baby and, uh, you know, many, many ups and downs through the years, but eventually the steps were to come into my life and become my foundation. And they, that happened really truly when I got into the big book. The big book was not a big component when I first came into AA. Uh, we didn't even have step meetings in 1975. You had to search them out. Um, so I didn't get into the big book right away, but a new journey began for me. And again, it was because of my passion for AA, I truly got into the big book because all my sponsees were starting to get into this new movement. They were getting into the big book. And because I wanted to continue to be a vital person, 
you know, and a vital channel for my higher power. I said, I got to get on board. And I started going to these big book roundups and, and doing uh, big book studies and all of that kind of stuff. And I could really wrap up, you know, all the 12 steps for you very simply, because, you know, I, uh, again, just gave you a little bit about, you know, one, two, and three, that I did have the surrender that I needed in the first step. And eventually the pain uh, was, the, the, was the motivator. Um, and I had, I got the willingness, you know, I love that one line in the, in the, you know, are you willing to believe, you know, do you believe and are you willing to believe? It covers everybody, you know, you just have to be one of those willings. So I was willing. And so my faith came and uh, I had the second step. And then the third step, you know, is a daily, you know, uh, daily decision that I make, so forth and so on. Um, you know, I, I memorized, you know, uh, the third step prayer and that's up here. And I have many things that sponsors have given me through the years to memorize and they're part of my intuitive thinking, you know, so, uh, when something comes up, my intuitive thinking really does give me these beautiful solutions. And that's the difference today. Years ago, we didn't live in the solutions. We, we, there was a lot of camaraderie and pain. In, early, in my early, you know, we, 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 we talked our problems for hours at a time, but nobody was talking solutions. And that's the difference today of the big book recovery is that now I can tell my girls when, you know, somebody's going through something, oh, it sounds like, you know, uh, we agnostics, you know, that chapter, because we can find the solutions. So, you know, I had the third step and then, you know, there's, I learned along the way, and I love this, that there's four impediments that keep me out of the sunlight of the spirit. The first impediment is a resentment. I'm not willing to give up. The second impediment is a secret. I'm not willing to tell. The third is a vicarious thrill. I'm not willing to give up. And the fourth is a restitution that I'm not willing to make. So right there was the fourth through the ninth step. I have to get rid of those resentments and fears and do those inventories. I can't, I'm as sick as my secrets. I got to get those secrets out. Vicarious thrills are going to get me into trouble with those defects. So six and seven, get rid of the vicarious thrills. They, they cause problems. Uh, restitution, you know, that's a gift. We give ourselves. When I first came into AA and you talked about amends, oh, I was highly, you know, I thought if I gave my family the 12 steps and they worked them, I'd be fine, you know, but the steps weren't there for them. I got to do this work. So I make the restitutions. Now I get to live in the glory of my higher power in 10, 11, and 12. And I truly am a person who believes in this. I, I, I am by no means a saint. I got, you know, I fall, um, you know, I, I, I was on a meeting this week where I read a third step and it said, you know, the, the paragraph that I read was actually about how my higher power doesn't judge me. He knows I fall. And it, the, last, the last sentence was, when are you going to get this? <laughs> You know, because we're going to have the duality of life is always going to be with me, the ups and downs. And, you know, um, I always say I'm one thought away from a crime, you know, because the thinking, but the second thought, because of my recovery is my higher power. The first thought is always going to be that lie or that, oh, you can do it. But then the second thought is my higher power set me straight because my sanity returned in the 10th step. You know, I got clear thinking in the 10th step. I can see, you know, where uh, the, the, the anger and the resentment and the dishonesty, the selfishness, the fears come in. And it tells me to deal with them immediately so that they don't build into anything. You know, uh, so I, I just love that. And I love the fact that I have ceased fighting anything or anybody. I was a big fighter. I'm the person who had my finger in somebody's face every day you know, because of this, you know, disease of the attitudes, and I just didn't handle, you know, myself. So, you know, the fact that I have ceased fighting anything or anybody is just such a wonderful, 
you know, uh, promise that has been given to me. Um, I love my sponsees who do a daily inventory with me. You know, we do that 11 step, you know, you know, where have you been dishonest, selfish, you know, where, you know, where is it? What could you have done better? And then I always love the fact that it ends with, you know, uh, God forgives you and you'll do better tomorrow, you know? So everything has been covered for me. Everything has been covered for me. And then, you know, I really truly believe that we all are on 12 step calls every day of our lives. Everything that I experience today, somebody may need to hear tomorrow. And that has been my experience. When I, whatever I go through, whether they're bad things or whatever, it seems that, you know, I have the ability to then say to somebody, oh, I've been there. Let me tell you, you know, and so we're always on 12 step calls and my privilege you know, Bill talked about the fact that doing 12-step work was a privilege, you know, my, and that is my privilege. And my thing is that, you know, you hear in the rooms of AA that I may be the only copy of the big book somebody's going to see. So I don't need to impress any of you people in AA. But if a person walks into an AA room today for the first time and I'm at the podium speaking, I want them to be able to say, Oh, that nice lady is here. Oh, great. I don't want anybody to come in and say, that bitch is here. I'm gone. You know? So I carry myself with dignity and grace today. You know, I'm able to do that because God has given me all of these spiritual tools that give me these principles to be an honorable person and have integrity and all of the things that I wanted to be. You know, so God has given that all to me. Uh, many people know I love when we talk about a vision for you. And I love the line where it says that, you know, God, uh, God will give you the ability to, you know, make the life you crave. And that's what all of this has done for us. You know, we get to live the lives that we wanted all along, but booze was in the way. You know, I didn't even know what I craved for the longest time, but a vision for you tells me that I can have that. And I used to always hear you'll be catapulted into the fourth dimension. And along the line, somebody told me, you know what the fourth dimension is? Reality. How do you like that? My program and my higher power has given me a reality today that I want to be in, you know? good, bad, or indifferent. I like my life. I like Debbie. I like being this and everything around me, you know? Um, so that's my new reality. So AA uh, has given me uh, certainly beyond anything. Um, you know, I now have, uh, you know, nieces and nephews and grandchildren who have never seen me drink. And I never take that for granted, you know. And this is someone who wasn't going to live to be 20, who was suicidal for a few years into AA, and but for the grace of God, didn't pick up the first drink, you know, and got a shot at having God continue to lead me closer and closer to him. And that is the whole message of our big book, is to develop, to get that higher power, in the second step, and then the rest of the work is to keep us close to that higher power. I don't want to reach a point. I, I have always been an active member of AA because I don't want to reach a point where I start working the steps backwards. I don't want to reach that point where I stop doing 12-step work, stop praying, stop taking an inventory and looking at myself, Stop making amends because what happens when I work it backwards, the, all the pain comes back, all the insanity comes back, and I'm back at step one picking up a drink. So I work very hard to maintain a spiritual fitness, and it's not all that hard even. You know, yes, I do a lot of work to maintain it, but it's really not all that hard. Um, I do two-way prayer today where I sit and I listen to my higher power, you know, um, I really do try and I've learned to, you know, figure out whose voice it is, 
you know, if it's Debbie's or truly him. And, you know, I, I, I love that I have learned about the four absolutes. If it's honest, if it's pure, if it's selfless and it's filled with love, it's my higher power. So I want to end with, dear God, maybe I'm not what I should be. Maybe I'm not what I could be. But thank you, God, I'm not what I used to be. Thank you. Debbie, thank you so much. Um, I could just keep listening to you. You, uh, you said so much good stuff. I took notes during that. Um, yeah, thank you. We are super grateful for you for coming out here and sharing with us. And um, we are going to have Eric read the promises. Hey, I'm Eric. I'm an alcoholic. These are the promises. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We, we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. Thank you, Eric. And again, thank you, Debbie. Super grateful. I know it's late there. Uh, it's like 10 o'clock. It, it's 11 o'clock right now. But uh, thank you. And I hope everybody enjoyed the meeting. You can find this on YouTube. And next week, July 3rd, we have Polly P from Jacksonville, Florida. So hope to see you all here. And we are going to close with the prayer of Debbie's choice. And I'm going to say, when we offer up the Lord's Prayer tonight, will we offer it up for the alcoholic that is unbelievable as it may sound, has never heard of our program. And for the alcoholic that has heard of it, but for one reason or another has had to go and try again. And an extra special prayer from anyone anywhere that takes in something today, that they'll have a chance to come in here and live a sober life. Whose father? Our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Thank you all. Thanks Debbie, have a great night. Thanks so much Debbie. Great. Thank you, Thank you. You touched my heart. I could.